Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you have already fulfilled your promise to raise our Lord Jesus from the dead and to exalt him at your right hand. We thank you that he has also given us a promise that he would come to us in the power of his Spirit, that he would be among us as we read and hear his word. And so we pray with full hearts of joy, Lord Jesus, that you would stand among us, that you would move among us as we sit in these pews, that you would open our eyes to see your grace through faith, that you would open our minds to understand the Scriptures, and as you did on that first Easter Sunday, that you would cause the hearts of your disciples to burn within them in love and in joy, in the assurance of your presence and the confidence of Christian faith. So come to us, we pray, as you have promised, subdue us to yourself by the scepter of your word, and bring us all, we pray, to kneel before you and to call you Lord of all. And this we pray for the sake of our Savior and for our own blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Now, our scripture reading this morning is from the gospel according to John chapter 20. You'll find this chapter in the Pew Bible. There should be a copy in the Pew rack in front of you, and the passage is on page 906. And for our children who have their children's Bible, the passage is on page 1340. John's Gospel, chapter 20, and we're going to read the first 18 verses. Let us hear God's Word. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back, to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father 
and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. The gospel according to John, the last of the four gospels to be written, may in some ways be likened to a great opera on the theme of darkness and light. The prologue or overture begins by telling us that light, Jesus, light has come into the world and the darkness has never been able to extinguish it. In the first act, which stretches from chapter 1 to chapter 12, it is a story of light shining into the darkness. It's summarized in Jesus' words about himself in John chapter 8 and verse 12, as it happens, the verse through which I was first brought to faith in Christ. I am the light of the world, says Jesus. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. But then, at the beginning of chapter 13, the scene changes. No longer the light shining in the darkness, but the light withdrawing from the darkness. And also, as we are told in these chapters, very specifically by John, when Judas leaves the room, we are told that Judas went out, and it was night. The light withdraws from the darkness, and the darkness is forced out of the presence of the light. But then these last two chapters, 18 and 19 in John's gospel, bring us to a third act. And in that third act, describing the sufferings, crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, there is a story of how the light seems to have been extinguished by the darkness. And so, one can almost imagine the last notes of a death march in verse 42 of chapter 19. So, because of the Jewish day of preparation since the tomb was close at hand. They laid Jesus there. And now in chapter 20, we come to the beginning of the final act, and the music begins to change, morning music, as the darkness gives way to the dawn and then to the full light of day. And as great composers are able to do, with musical instruments in the midst of the orchestra, we might hear an instrument playing what would sound like the footsteps of someone coming in the darkness to the garden tomb. And we would have this sense in this great drama that we were about to see possibly the first person in all history, who would see the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the first witness to the resurrection. And actually, one of the things that runs through John's gospel is the theme that Jesus is on trial before the world. And John is telling the story of how God brings witness after witness to Jesus' identity and to His saving grace. And they point to Jesus, and they tell people that Jesus is the light of the world. But when this witness appears, we are in for a surprise, because this witness is a woman. Nothing unusual about that in the 21st century But if you were reading this gospel or hearing this gospel in the first century, it would be more than merely a surprise because, of course, in those days, those far-off days, the testimony of a woman was worthless in a Jewish law court. And so there's something to the first readers and hopefully to us 
slightly staggering about the fact that the first witness to the resurrection that we see, even if we in the gloom cannot make out her face, is not actually Peter or John who have already been at the garden tomb, but a woman, and indeed a woman called Mary. What I think is even more surprising is this, that if I were a son, the Mary to whom I would first show myself would be Mary, my mother. But it's not Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is the first witness to His resurrection. Or perhaps Mary of Bethany, the brother, the sister of of brother Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, that family that in a sense was Jesus' second family, home from home, perhaps it would be to Mary, the sister of Lazarus. But no, as we're told in the opening verse and in the closing verse of our section, as though these bookends are there to say to us, don't you see how utterly surprising this is, that the first person in history to see the risen Christ, to come to resurrection faith in the risen Christ, is this woman called Mary Magdalene. And it cannot possibly be accidental. It cannot simply be a happenstance that this is the first person Jesus happened to bump into, because He has not shown Himself to Simon Peter. He has not shown Himself to the disciple whom He loved, but He comes clearly for a very special reason and shows Himself to be the risen Lord and Savior, first to Mary Magdalene. So why? Why pass by the two leading apostles? Why not go first to his mother? Why not go to a member of that family that was his second family and second home in Bethany? Why come especially to Mary Magdalene? And the answer, I think, uh, actually lies on the surface of the Gospels. It is because it's in Mary Magdalene, particularly, most clearly and strikingly, that we find the story of what it means to know the risen Christ and to be brought to a living faith in Him. Or to put it in other words, it's because of all people that surround the cross, that surround the empty tomb, it's in Mary Magdalene that the Easter message and its power shines forth most clearly. And I say that for several reasons. The first is this. As we think about Mary Magdalene, this woman who comes in the darkness to visit the tomb of Jesus, the first thing that we learn about her in Scripture is that she was a woman of substance before she met the Lord Jesus. She was a woman of substance. Actually, the first thing that we're told about her is that she belonged to a very small group of women who, out of their own financial resources, ministered to the needs of Jesus' traveling band. Our little nuclear family, a father, a mother, uh, four children, I have some sense of uh, what is involved in, in feeding four grown children. But here we are speaking about 13 young men, Jesus probably the oldest of them all, and others who are with them. And so meeting their needs over a period of three years called for extraordinary financial resources. And this woman, Mary Magdalene, was one of those women who, out of her resources, made it possible for Jesus and the apostles to engage in their mission. 
Sometimes, of course, as you know in the history of the Christian church, she has been confused with the woman who anointed the Lord Jesus and who is described as a sinner, uh, or to just parse that statement, a woman of the streets, a hooker. But it is, I think, quite certain that this woman was not that woman. Indeed, if we were to find a parallel to this woman in our culture, this woman would not be a woman of the streets. This woman would be a member of First Presbyterian Church or Trinity Cathedral or First Baptist, a woman of substance. And yet, dare I say, like all women of substance, there is a dark blot in her life. And that dark blot in her life leads us to the second thing that we learn about her. I sometimes think that she is the New Testament's version of the great Syrian general Naaman in the Old Testament Scriptures who is described as being a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the second thing that we learn actually about Mary Magdalene is that though she was a woman of substance before she met the Lord Jesus, she was also a woman in deep bondage before she encountered Him. There are people in the Bible, Old and New Testaments, just as there are people today who whenever their name is mentioned, there's a, there's a little line that that doesn't need to be there because everybody knows it, everybody thinks it. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, is the great Old Testament illustration. Everybody who knows the Old Testament knows what the next words will be. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. Or the New Testament's version is Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And Mary Magdalene fits into that category because Mary Magdalene is described in the New Testament as Mary Magdalene from whom seven devils had gone out. Now, I don't know what picture that conjures up in your mind, um, some of you have seen or at least seen trailers for The Exorcist, or you have seen things on YouTube's exorcisms and so on, and you, you generally speaking imagine people who are very evidently out of their minds, like the Gadarene demoniac running about in the graveyards, just utterly uncontrollable. But it seems it's possible to be possessed by evil in a quite different way. I think of the man who was in the synagogue when Jesus came to preach. And I presume he was there every Sabbath day, sitting in his seat or standing in his place, and the service would go on and the service would go on. But when the Lord Jesus began to preach, when the Lord Jesus was present, it was as though there was, a, there was a great unveiling of something in his soul, and he couldn't keep it in. And the, 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 the chains of the evil one that bound him seemed to be stretched to the limit as he cried out. I've never forgotten an occasion in another church than this, where in the midst of a sermon on a Sunday evening service, the very same thing happened right up there in the gallery of the church. And all unknown to the person, I'm convinced because uh, I was able to speak to him afterwards, he had no idea what was happening. He began to debate and to argue with what was being said. 
And perhaps this is how it was with Mary Magdalene. Your normal, able woman of substance, but a deep chain bound her to the powers of darkness. And that's why I think she's chosen here, because she models for us as an illustration of us uh, what Jesus believed and what the New Testament teaches is true of every single one of us, that we are by nature dead in trespasses and sins, we follow the course of this world, and we are enslaved to the evil one. Somebody has written about this, that you are bound by an invisible chain, a silk cord, whose strength you will never know until you attempt to break it. And that's true. Most of us by nature say we can do this easily. These sins that beset us, these chains that bind us, those dark and demonic oppressions that we experience, we can change all that in a moment when we decide for Jesus Christ. We will do that when the moment comes. But you see, like everything else, you need practice. And what you actually discover when you practice, or when you say to yourself, I, I know I need to do better and be better to be acceptable with God, and you practice, what do you discover? Well, you discover what a man that I would dare say was so marked by virtue, it is unlikely that there is a man in this room who could hold a candle to him discovered, that he was fast bound in sin and nature's night and did not love the Lord Jesus. And if you doubt me, you will find his name, Wesley, in the hymn book. And see, this was what was quintessentially true of this woman. A very interesting thing when you, when you read about demon-possessed individuals, men and women and young people in the Gospels, one thing is true of all of them. None of them ever voluntarily comes to the Lord Jesus to ask for help not one single one. They are all by some means or another brought to the Lord Jesus, or a friend asks that the Lord Jesus will rescue them. And at the end of the day, in the gospel, that is the ultimate evidence that I am bound in sin and nature's night. that there is nothing in my will, nothing in my affections that would cause me to come and fall down before the Lord Jesus and say to the Lord Jesus, be my Savior, be, be my Master, be my Lord. And that means, of course, that for this woman, and I'm sure she must have felt it, I'm sure it's one of the reasons she was the one who came back to the tomb, that for this woman there must have been something almost excruciatingly painful and perhaps socially difficult about being saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, because it must have meant for her, whether it happened privately or publicly, a tremendous sense of exposure when the veneer was taken away and the reality was laid bare. I have a friend who had some fairly major and very painful surgery in terms of its effects, who was put on to powerful pain-killing drugs, and uh, he is a minister friend. He became addicted to them. And he was able to well hide it from most. And as he was visiting, not for his own sake, he was visiting a, a rehabilitation clinic, and one of the staff came over to him and, 
and said to him, you're a minister. He said, yes, I'm a minister. And, and the, the man said to him, well, if you're a minister, what God do you trust in? And he said, I'm a Christian minister, and I trust in the God of the Bible. And the man turned to him and said, no, you don't trust in the God of the Bible. Your God is drugs. Presumably, he'd seen the telltale signs that others might not notice. And this sudden moment of exposure, and Mary Magdalene must have known that sudden moment of exposure. That's why she comes to the tomb in John's narrative as the quintessential illustration of what Jesus Christ does when he breaks into the lives of those who do not love him to cause them to come out of the darkness, to be released from the bondage. And it really raises the question for us, doesn't it? Uh, so who is your God? To what God are you bound? And the glorious thing that began to happen to this woman that's really brought to a marvelous climax here in chapter 20 of John's gospel is that Christ's eye diffused a quickening ray. She woke the dungeon flamed with light. The chains fell off. Her heart was free. She rose went forth and began to follow. So this woman comes in the darkness as someone who was a woman of substance before she met the Lord Jesus. But a woman in deep bondage before she was changed by the Lord Jesus. And then there's a third thing. She comes here, yes, for all the grace of Christ already in her life, she comes here as a woman who does not yet fully understand the work of the Lord Jesus. She stands at the empty tomb and she is weeping. Actually, the whole first hours of Easter Sunday were filled with weeping and downcast eyes, the two on the road to Emmaus whom Jesus encountered. Their eyes are cast down. They had hoped that Jesus would be the Redeemer, but He is apparently not the Redeemer, and their hope had turned to despair. And Mary Magdalene comes for the second time to the tomb. Why did she come for the second time to the tomb? I think she came as someone whose love and faith had been disappointed, come perhaps to speak in the emptiness of the garden to the Jesus who was dead, just as some of us go to the grave of a loved one and there in the, the silence speak, speak out our sense of loss and pain that we know none other understands. Actually, it's very interesting. I think John is the only writer in the New Testament who gives indication that he loved the Song of Solomon because this, this, is, a, this is a scene in Mary's life so reminiscent of the scene in the young girl's life when her lover appears to have disappeared and she goes looking for him and asks the watchman in the city, if you know where my beloved is, then point me in that direction. She's, she's a woman for whom Jesus had come to mean absolutely everything. She poured out her substance into his disciple band, and he apparently had delivered her from the powers of darkness. And now she comes, I'm sure, because one of the things she's wondering is, if the dark powers will return and destroy her again. But you remember what the angels say to her. It must have sounded almost cruel. 
Why are you looking for the living among the dead? And so she comes because she doesn't yet understand. He doesn't understand what he had already taught the disciples and what, in an intense way, for the next few weeks he is going to teach them that it was necessary for him to die. Otherwise, there would be no forgiveness of sins. And it was necessary for him to rise. Otherwise, there would be no triumph and victory over grave and death and hell and bondage. And she hadn't taken it in. Like the others, she hadn't been able to take in the gospel, and she hadn't understood it. And he was there to teach her the power of the gospel. I thought you might be just like that. And none of this is new to you. You may have believed most of this all your life. You were, you were taught it from childhood, and it's still somewhere in your life, but it's never really come into focus. And actually, the truth of the matter is you don't really understand the gospel at all. You have no idea what the gospel is about, because it's just a story locked up in a book. It could be just another myth. And it's never gripped you that the reason Jesus died was to deliver you from the darkness of your sin and its guilt and its power over your life, and that the reason you don't love Him and trust Him and enjoy Him and live for Him is not because you are so strong and brave and self-sufficient, but because you are bound in sin and nature's night, and you can't love Jesus. It isn't that you've chosen, I am not going to love Jesus. It's you're not capable of loving Jesus, even if you tried. And my friends, I say it that way, almost in an irritating way, because if you are irritated, then show me it's not true. If you're irritated by the notion that a mere mortal man would say from behind a massive pulpit, you are not capable of trusting Christ if you don't trust Him already, then prove that the statement is false. Work up all your powers today and say, I believe in the risen Christ, and He is everything to me. And you know you are utterly incapable of meeting the challenge. Isn't that true? You are as dead as you ever were if you're in that situation. Unless Jesus Christ comes out of the shadows and does what he did here for Mary Magdalene. Because this woman of substance, this woman who had been in bondage, this woman who had not fully grasped the gospel, was the very first person ever to know and trust and hold the risen Lord Jesus Christ. How did that happen? It's actually very simple. When he appeared, she mistook him for somebody else. Of course she mistook him for somebody else. You don't see the grave clothes and then turn round and see a fully clothed man and think he's anything else but the gardener in this situation. So what was it that changed everything? It was one word, just one word, Mary. You see, if we'd read through John's gospel from the beginning, we would have heard Jesus say, now, here's the, here's the secret. My sheep hear my voice. I call them by name, and they follow me. And that's what he did here. 
he called her by name. And that was all she needed to know, that this was the voice of Jesus, that he was risen from the grave, that he had kept all his promises, that the darkness would not return, that she would be his forever, and his promise would be fulfilled, that she would live for all eternity in his presence, which was the greatest desire of her life. And surely it's one of the greatest mysteries in the world that so many people can't think clearly enough to see if you don't want to live in Christ's presence now, why would you ever want to spend eternity in His presence? But she did. And it's the reality that is repeated in every Christian believer's life that they are conscious on an occasion like this or as they read the Scriptures or hear others talk about the Scriptures. They are conscious of another voice entering their life, naming them by name, and calling them to be His. So I ask you this Easter Sunday morning, have you ever heard Jesus call your name? Or even this, are you hearing Jesus call your name? Because it's this that brings this woman and others throughout the ages who have been like her to rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to regard a Sunday morning like this as but the beginning of treats and joys that will last for all eternity, and makes them rejoice on an Easter Sunday morning. Remember in the biography of Dr. Sangster, a famous minister in London, who died, I think, of throat cancer. And so, on his last Easter Sunday morning, he was not able to utter a word, and so he wrote a note to his son, Paul. How grievous to wake up on Easter Sunday morning and not to be able to shout, Christ is risen. And then he added, how much more tragic to wake up on Easter Sunday morning and not to want to shout, Christ is risen. You know, there's a sense in which Jesus gives you exactly what you want. If you want Him, you'll get Him. And if you don't want Him, you'll not get Him now, and you'll not have Him for all eternity. And the message of Easter Sunday morning is, because He is risen, He can make the difference between night and and day, not only now, but forevermore. So when you hear His voice, you say to Him, Savior, Master, as Mary of Magdalene did. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You that in Your presence we are able to rejoice in the resurrection triumph of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray You would work faith in us and fill us with joy and hope. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.